The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. That's Malik Hill. I'm Joey Tysick. Thought I'd change it up today. And uh, You kind of threw me off. <laughs> I heard my name first. I was like... I know. I, fe- I was feeling like I was getting a little selfish, uh, putting myself first. It's not usually how you're supposed to do it. Um, but, again, we're like at the dead period of sports. Unless, our, unless we had a good baseball team, but we don't. And we always talk about that. Um... Today, we're just going to wrap up some Summer League stuff <clears throat> from the NBA. Um, I watched less and less Summer League, of course, as it went on, so that'll be brief. And then there's a couple of news uh, items in the NFL, and then we have a top... Well, we kind of have a top 10 list. It's realistically top 5, but we have so many honorable mentions. It's almost a top 10 list, um, so we'll get to that, and that'll be the the meat and potatoes of today's episode. Um, so to start things off... Malik, how did the uh, summer league wrap up for you? Did you enjoy it? So, was it everything you hoped for? <laughs> was it everything I hoped for? Honestly, I, I kind of fell off in like the second half. Oh, of the summer league. okay. He fell I, off. I was all the way in to start as I usually am, like the first week and a half. Mm-hmm. I was watching most games, catching all the highlights. And yeah, after those that first week and a half, I pretty much was like catching individual highlights for the most part, seeing yeah. how individual players were doing. I watched like the first half of the championship. It was Cleveland versus Houston. Mm-hmm. It was okay. Uh, Isaiah Mobley deserves a roster spot for Cleveland. He's really good. <coughs> uh, Cam Whitmore won MVP. Guy, everybody He's very the talented. To take. Lead, we all knew he was extremely talented. It's still a shock he fell to 20. But, uh... Amani Bates, first championship. <laughs> <laughs> he got his ring. Yeah. Is he satisfied like Anthony Davis after the bubble ring? He did make... We the, shall see. He did make the all-summer league second team or whatever. Yeah. Good Good for him. It was, it was progress for Amani. Mm-hmm. He, he played solid team basketball, hit some shots. It was cool. But my overall takeaway is it's it's going to be another pretty good rookie class in my opinion. Mm-hmm. There's there's a lot of talent. I th- I don't know if this is a hot take at this point, but I think the years of there being like drop offs in draft classes, like two or three years in a row, mm-hmm. I think that might be over. Okay. Because the talent is at such a high level. Now there there's still every now and then going to be classes that are weaker than the others. Mm-hmm. But I I don't see there being, like, 2013 classes where I think that was the year Giannis went, like, 17. And there were, like, two or three good players in the bunch of... The the 2010 draft has Paul George and Gordon Hayward are the only two that are on a team still. John John Wall should have a roster spot, but he doesn't right now. Yeah. But, yeah, the the talent level is just at such a high. Even with a lot of guys not having a ton of fundamentals, Mm -hmm. the just the raw talent and athleticism on display from this era of young players. They know how to do things that NBA players are doing at, like, 14 hmm. I was from say, a skill standpoint. I don't know if it's, like, the ceiling is as high, but I feel like the depth is better than a ever That's what it is, yeah. Because they're pulling from, obviously, now overtime elite, G League, um, overseas. I just feel like the talent pool in general is just... I guess the talent pool as a whole has a higher ceiling. Uh, so, you're, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, they're, like we I just said, uh, Cam Whitmore dropped to 20. In a lot of draft classes, especially in, like, the 2000s and early 2010s, he's probably a top three pick. Mm. Cam Whitmore has that level of, like, <laughs> overall talent. Jordan Walsh fell to Boston in the late first round. He was a five-star guy. He looks like he's going to be with the Celtics for a long time. He was very yeah. impressive. 
Keontae George, I was big on him being almost a top 10 pick. He falls out the top 10. Looks like he could almost be a Donovan Mitchell clone. Mm -hmm. Like, there are guys you could just go through the list through the draft. There are so many guys even going through, like, into the second round. Guys like Amani, where there are guys that are going to be glue pieces for teams for Mm -hmm. a very long time. Well, that's like I mentioned, too, just uh, watching Trace Jackson Davis on Golden State. Now he was he up, went like fifty four. He was up for Player of the Year in college, and he was basically the end of the draft. The Warriors traded up to go grab him. So, and then you think of even guys that are undrafted um, that tend to have a chance to make a splash these days. So, yeah, I agree. You never know. It's crazy. Um, what did you think about Marcus Sasser dropping forty? I loved it more than more than I even thought I would. Because of how how rough his shooting was in like the first three or four games of summer league, mm-hmm. he was getting good looks and they just weren't going outside of like the paint and like the free throw line area. His shot wasn't really falling. So to see him get his chance with Asar Thompson being sat out, yeah, and him being like the the one drafted guy this year on the team that got to get the ball in his hands and just see what he could do in one of the last games for the Pistons. Mm -hmm. It was incredible to see. I mean, we know how talented he is as a player, but seeing him, he put everything on display in that game, Mm -hmm. especially in the second half. His quickness and his handle, like he he was making dudes look silly Mm -hmm. off the dribble in the fourth quarter, easily getting to the rim. His jumper was going. He was hitting step-back jumpers. He was just in the zone. And uh, it made it easier to get rid of a certain French young man. Yeah. Unfortunately, it looks like it's it's just not. Killian Hayes, I don't know if he could score 40 in 2K. Mm. <laughs> and Marcus Sasser just showed on nights where he gets it going, he could go for 25 plus like it's nothing. Yeah. And he all of his positives are Killian's negatives. And he's just as aggressive on defense. So... Let's get Marcus Sass for those minutes. Uh, the Pistons did sign, what's his name, Casalone. Yeah, Casalone and Jared Roden. Yeah, two, two-way contracts. Yeah, they both shot well. Yeah, I don't know. They're not Buddy <laughs> Bayheim. <laughs> They're not Buddy. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I think that's it for the Summer League. It's over. Now we got a little while before the NBA actually starts up. Listen, if only Buddy was just a little bit more athletic. <sighs> yeah. Like, you see what Hunter Tyson did with Denver? Mm-hmm. He had some really good games. Yeah. But he had, he also had some bursts where he would go, like, baseline and just dunk one. Mm-hmm. You're not seeing that from Buddy. Yeah. Like, there's yeah. just not something that just it's not his game. draws your attention. Yeah. Um. So, we'll move on to football. It's basically going to be all football going forward, most likely. Um, unless something major happens, if Damian Lillard gets traded, but apparently the Blazers are still being uh, playing hardball. Um, in the NFL, finally one of the major signings has happened. DeAndre Hopkins is a Tennessee Titan. First thoughts. Why? <laughs> he wants the bag. Listen, it, it has been documented by a lot of journalists and very good YouTube football guys that I follow. That Tennessee is kind of a receiver graveyard if you've paid attention over the past 20 years. Yeah. And just throughout their history, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like, their top receiver in franchise history is probably Derek Mason, who was extremely underrated. Shouts out to Derek Mason. He had several thousand-yard seasons. But who's talking about Derek Mason? Yeah. You draft A.J. Brown, it's clear that he's going to be the truth, and you trade him. Yeah. You got Kenny Britt. He was a solid big listen, big catch guy. Nate Washington. <laughs> he lit up the Lions yeah. with Jake Locker. I mean, good for Nate Washington. Like the just just the list of and then yeah. Randy Randy Moss at the end of his career. Uh Andre Johnson at the end of his Andre career. Andre Johnson at the end of his career. Leo Jones. Oh, what do you say? Randy Moss. What do you say? Yeah. Like, do we both do we agree that the Titans window is basically closed? Yeah, I think I think that's where this plays is for the Titans. This is their last chance. Derrick Henry is about to hit past his prime for running backs. Um, 
they have no weapons for Ryan Tannehill. Traylon Burks probably has, you know, some good upside, no. but we still haven't fully seen yeah. it yet. Well, we haven't said it is a very good pickup for the Titans. Yeah. It's something they desperately needed. Mm -hmm. And I think for Hopkins, it, I mean, it was apparent that he just, he's not going for a ring. He's looking for money. And I think, it, I mean, it could still be like he wants to be on a competitive team. Um, so the Titans are able to give him the money and they're, you know, still on the cusp of being competitive. But unfortunately, they're in the AFC, and that is not a fun time. Yeah. Now, their division still isn't the greatest, but the Jag the Jaguars yeah. are kind of, mm -hmm. they're, they're becoming what people think the Jaguars are going to be. Yeah. And, yeah, they're, they're, they're just the Titans, man. Yeah. Like, it's weird. It's, it's unfortunate to say, but like they're they're the Tennessee. Titans. Yeah, but at the end of the day, like every time we say that though, it, the Titans are always in the mix somehow. I know yeah. it's partly part of, of it. Their part of it is the division, and they have enough talent. Yeah, to win eight to like yeah. eleven games in a really good year. Like Vrabel is a really good coach. They have a really solid defensive core for the most part. Um, and then when you have guys like Ryan Tannehill, who kind of plays it a little safer. You have Derrick Henry that can just run the ball. You can really control games, and that's kind of what they've always been good at. It's nothing flashy necessarily, but it's just kind of almost like old school football. Um, yeah. Shouts out to the late '90s, early 2000s Titans. <laughs> I, I want to give them respect. Yeah, they they deserve it. Eddie George and yeah, they really good team. Lost in the Super Bowl by less than a yard. Depressing. Uh, so that but was kind of the major thing. They'll be better than the Cardinals. Yeah. A lot of people think the Cardinals might be like the worst in the league. So yeah, although I will tell you, if you get a chance, go on the Arizona Cardinals YouTube page, and they they did a whole like documentary on Kyler Murray's rehab. It's pretty interesting, actually. Mm. It's a, it's a good watch. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll have to see. I, the Titans, I think it's their last ditch effort to to make a run at something. I mean, they've already drafted Will Levis, so if they start off slow, I think Will Levis will probably come in, um, and that'll be that. Um, the, I, I think both Derrick Henry and DeAndre Hopkins are probably like in the last leg of their primes. Yeah. They still have some left, but mm -hmm, yeah. for sure. Um, the other big news in the NFL right now is the running back controversy. And we talked about it a little bit previously. Um, but now that we're past the franchise tag deadline or the contract deadline, uh, so to speak, um, Josh Jacobs, Josh Jacobs is without a deal and Saquon Barkley are without a deal. So their team will be franchising tagging them, but right now they're holding out. Tony so, Pollard is the only one that signed. Yes. Tony Pollard and also he did already. He also didn't get a long term deal, but he did accept the franchise tag. Yeah. Um so now we have two of the biggest running backs in the game talking about holding out. They're obviously gonna hold out through OTAs and stuff because they don't have to report because they're technically not on a contract. Um or through training camp. But now the, the question is, will they sit out like week one? We've seen it in the past with Le'Veon Bell. I don't think it really worked out for him. It worked out for his pockets, but it didn't work out for his playing career. Yeah. Um, and he's come out and said that he actually regretted that move um, back in the day. And then, but now there's this problem with running back contracts that nobody wants to pay running backs. They have their rookie deals that last, I think, four years. They can be eligible to be franchise tagged for like two years. So then these running backs who usually hit their prime 24, 25, can't become a free agent until they're like 27 or 28. And that's when nobody really wants to pay them anymore. So then it's just it's a weird, messed up kind of system. Um, a lot of people have also pointed out, on the other hand, that, you know, the last, I think since 2009, there's been no like, elite running back that's won a Super Bowl. Um, so take it where you will. I think there needs to be some sort of middle ground. Um, but I think the problem is the franchise tag. The franchise tag was originally made to like help secure quarterbacks for some reason. Yeah, I remember remember when the Redskins franchise tag Kirk Cousins like two or three times. Yeah. Because they didn't want to give him the big deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now it's become – Basically, your franchise tagging your running back, or almost like in a lot of cases, it's just your best player, which just seems like such a busted thing. And the problem is, it's that was agreed upon so many years ago now, and it's going to be so difficult to change that rule or get it changed. And if they even do at some point, it'll be years and years down the line. Um, so 
I don't know how to fi- how to fix it. I'm not like in the business to know, but that seems like the biggest problem to me. Um, I don't know where where do you stand on it? Do you think running backs deserve more, or do you think running backs are overvaluing themselves? W- where are you kind of at? Because the game's going away from running backs. I am unfortunately not happy about it with myself. Kind of like 60-40 on the side of running backs today are overvalued. Mm-hmm. And it, it's it's a really, really tricky situation because you see the teams that are winning Super Bowls, they're doing it with like top-tier quarterbacks and high-level defenses. Yeah. And they have like really good skill talent around them, but specifically the running back isn't the most important thing. Yeah. But there are these top running backs are helping teams get into the playoffs every year. Right. Like there there are very few situations in the NFL, even through the years, where like Steven Jackson on the Rams was elite, but the Rams never really won because mm-hmm. the organization and the team was never that good. Josh Jacobs is on the Raiders. The Raiders can't ever really get it together. Yeah. But he's elite. Most elite running backs are on good teams, and mm-hmm. they help their team at least make pushes to the playoffs. Yeah. Derrick Henry forever. Yeah, that's why I'm 60-40, and it's so close. Mm-hmm. Because I running backs are important, and I love the running back position so much in yeah. what it – has done throughout my right. time of watching football. And that's where that's where my problem comes in with the franchise tag because if they get that get rid of the franchise tag, those guys can say, "Hey, if you're not going to pay me, I'll go test free agency, somebody else will pay me." And pretty much, yeah, if if you leave that team, somebody else will eventually pay that person. Somebody will try to improve their team. Um so I think that's where the franchise tag just comes into a problem. Um the other thing is, yes, a lot of teams that are successful still use running back by committee and just rotate their guys. We saw it with the chiefs. Um, I mean, Isaiah Pacheco is technically their starting running back, but Jarek McKinnon had a lot of huge touchdowns down the stretch. They still even use Clyde Edwards whole air at times. Yeah. Clyde Edwards was the first round pick, Mm -hmm. but now it seems like fans and NFL teams are coming together and kind of agreeing that the Isaiah Pacheco route is the best route. Right. Like, and find a guy with a lot of talent that hasn't been used up a ton in college with yeah. clear high-level talent mm-hmm. and mold him into something. And that's that becomes the problem, though, because when Isaiah Pacheco, he's going to be on his rookie deal, and because he's an older player, I, I just saw this on Twitter, actually, like this morning, that by the time that he's able to test free agency, he will be 28 or 29, and he's a seventh-round pick. So because they didn't use high draft capital for him, his rookie contract is much lower than anybody else. Yeah. And so like he's just never going to get that money. Which now if he if he you know doesn't really get any better, I think that's okay. But if by chance like he gets better in these next couple of years, then it becomes a problem again and it's just it's a whole cycle and I I don't know how to how to solve it cuz I I agree with you in the fact that I think some of the running backs are understandably overvaluing yourself. You're going to always overvalue yourself to a certain extent. Um, and you see that they do a lot of this stuff. And the the big one that I always bring up or that I've thought of is Austin Eckler talking about how he was talking about being traded. The Chargers didn't want to trade him because they were asking for like first round picks and stuff like that. So they obviously value him very highly. But when it comes to paying him, they won't. That's where it comes into a problem. And that's where people are starting to point to like collusion and stuff. And I don't want to necessarily point fingers at collusion, but it does start start to feel fishy that okay, you think that his trade value is this high, but you aren't willing to pay him. The other argument I see too is that Daniel Jones just got paid. They'd rather pay Daniel Jones than Saquon Barkley. That's also a little confusing because Daniel that Daniel specific Jones, situation looks very sketchy because it's Daniel Jones right. and Saquon Barkley. But when you look at the overall picture, it is more important to have your franchise quarterback yeah. than to have your top running back. That's the general idea. But those specific players make it weird. Yeah. And I think it's it's hard, too, because it's you're going off of one good Daniel Jones season, basically, thinking yeah. that maybe he's turned the corner. 
Hoping Brian Dable has unlocked him. And somewhat taking the chance, rather than going with a slightly more known quality quantity with Saquon Barkley, even though he does have some injury concerns here and there. Um, I don't know. It's, it's just it's tricky. Yeah. Uh, I'll say that. I, I understand all the top running backs coming together on social media and saying what they have to say. Mm-hmm. It It is a messed up situation, but hey, man. Like, yeah. the last elite running back to help a team get to the Super Bowl was it Todd Gurley? Maybe. I think that was it. And in between there, there are some really good running backs. But they didn't win the Super the Bowl. That's the problem. Yeah. They lost the, the Super Bowl. Was it set like 13 yeah, 7? Well, I can't. It was a really low score in Super Bowl. Like, helped them get all the way there and they couldn't finish the job. I think the best running back that's won a Marshawn Super Bowl. Marshawn Lynch, too. Yeah. I think Marshawn Lynch is the best, maybe, example of a high tier running back. But that's it. Um, the rest are your Isaiah Pacheco's, your LeGarrette Blunt in his final seasons and uh, stuff like that. Even back in 2009, uh, when the the Saints won, it was Pierre Thomas, who was kind of... Oh, man, I forgot. He was Pierre kind of Thomas. on the, the cusp. Yeah. So, yeah. It'll be interesting. I'm curious to see if the running backs are going to do anything because apparently they've been, you know, kind of talking amongst themselves uh, as the, the top, top guys to see if they'll do anything. Um, and it'll be really interesting. All right. Anything else you have that you can think of news and notes wise? Um... Before I guess just a, just a little baseball note. Shohei Otani is still doing the impossible for the most part. Yeah. Leading baseball in home runs and still being a great pitcher. He hit his 35th the other night. Yeah. And it's hilarious going on social media. There's like a large group of Aaron Judge fans under every Shohei tweet <laughs> saying, wait till Judge comes back. Yeah. And saying like the real best player in the league comes back soon. Mm-hmm. Shohei Otani is generational. There's yeah. there's nothing. He's beyond generational. Mm-hmm. And like, the other, yeah, I will say the other thing too is that you know, all of a sudden there's a couple, there's a few young guys in the MLB that are starting to boost up kind of the numbers. They yeah. got Ellie De La Cruz, um, hit for the cycle and all that stuff like really early on in his career. So there's some actual buzz around the MLB, but just a little bit. Yeah. Also the the trade discussions about Shohei Otani. Are picking up more. I don't assume it'll be anything serious anytime soon, but hey, when he's on the move, it'll be really interesting seeing where he goes. I don't want him to be a Yankee. That's where everybody goes. He won't be a Yankee. It's annoying. It, I I guarantee it won't happen. Please I don't guarantee, guarantee that. <laughs> um, the Yankees aren't what they used to be. Get out of here. All right. Let's get to the fun part. Today we decided to do a list. We were unsure of what our list was going to be. We wanted to do most hated players. Um, but for some, I want to see Same if we can get, with some guests. I want to see if we can get Chris on for that one or even my brother for that notion, just so we can all laugh at each other's hated players. Um, so today instead, one that we've always talked about doing that, I guess we never even done. Um, I thought we did, but it's just cause we talked about it. We're doing the best sports video games of all time. Now very we, important list for us. We're doing, yeah, very important. Uh, we like our sports games. I myself am a, a, a huge gamer, so I, I play everything under the sun, including sports games, of course. Um, so we have our top five, and then we each have a lot of honorable mentions to get through. So I don't know. You said you have six honorable mentions? Yes. So let's just bounce back and forth with our honorable mentions. We'll mention them, <clears throat> and then we'll get into the, the top five. So what was your first honorable mention or the first one that you just want to Say. So the first one I'll mention because it's the only s- sport where it's it's the one game. Time out. How am I about to word this? I don't know. It's a boxing game, and I don't have any other boxing games on my list. That's okay. what I want to say. Fight Night Three. Mm-hmm. I played Fight Night One and Two on the PS One and PS Two when I was younger, mm-hmm. but I never got like fully fully into the game yeah. until Fight Night Three. <laughs> and I love the soundtrack. I love like the creative player mode where you went from an amateur boxer all the way up to a champion. Mm-hmm. And it's just a game I really enjoyed. And it was hilarious that they had like 
Burger King sponsorship and the King would come into the ring mm-hmm. and raise up the card. Yeah. Funny part of the game. It's just, just a really fun boxing game I enjoyed. Okay. Fight well, Night 3. That's funny that I'm going to mention my first uh, honorable mention is also a boxing game. Nice. Um, but it's not one that you would expect. Um, I think this is my first ever sports game. It's possibly... It's probably one of my earliest video games that I've ever played. I kind of hope you bring up the game. The first boxing game I ever played was from the 90s. I hope this is... What no, this is not, this is from the 80s. Oh, boy. Uh, is this... This is Mike Tyson's, Mike Tyson punch, punch out, out. Ah. on the NES. Um, the, what's, the, what's the character's name? Tiny Little Mac? Was yeah, Little Mac. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, this is one of the first sports games I ever played. Probably the first, to be honest. Um, my other honorable mention might be the other first. But Mike Tyson's punch out was a game that my dad always played for the longest time. He always talked about how he went to like a local pizza shop or whatever, played at the arcades and stuff, and he talked about playing this game with his friends um, and the, just trying to get to Mike Tyson and saving all the codes, writing them down, um, so that when I was young, we had an NES, and I would try to play it. I could never get very far, and then when my brother got old enough, he started playing it, and we would just always go to it, and it's always just been one of our favorite games um to play and so yeah that's my first one important question after that did you did you beat mike tyson no i never have of course you did we have the code saved um because my brother got to mike tyson there before um but i don't know if he's ever beat mike tyson either it's it's very yeah. tough as a as a somewhat video game historian i know about the difficulty of beating mike yeah and yeah seeing people actually do it it's kind of incredible. It's like you have to be perfect. Yeah, because most of the characters in that game have, you know, uh, routines and stuff that it's kind of easy to kind of memorize, and that's all it is. Mike Tyson doesn't have as much of a routine, and it's all reactionary, so that's it gets pretty tough. Yeah, so to kind of speed it up, I have uh, two two basketball game honorable mentions. Okay. One of them is College Hoops 2K8. Mm, okay. In my opinion, probably the best college basketball game. Is that the J.J. Reddick cover? Greg Oden. Oh, okay. 2K. Yeah. 8. Gotcha. Yeah. The last one, the last 2K college game, I believe, it was on the 360. I logged in so many hours playing against college roommates in 2K8, playing the classic teams, playing some of the like regular teams from that era. Just a really fun game. And mm-hmm. just the that era of college games was really fun, getting them yearly. Yeah. Both football and basketball. And NBA Live 05. Mm. Great game. Just, just it, it meant so much to me as a it's one of the first basketball games that I really like dove into. Mm-hmm. It was the first game with the dunk contest, I believe. Yeah. And the the all the overall all star festivities. Yep. <clears throat> Soundtrack was great. Um I just just a really good game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Controls weren't too hard. Just yeah, fun game. Yeah. Those early live games were great. Back when live was still kind of better than 2k yeah um my second game uh i'll also can i tie these in no i can't um my second game honorable mention another nes game double dribble i've heard of double dribble but (laughs) it's a basketball game on the nes if you ever look up family guy look up family guy nes or family guy double dribble and there used to be like this glitch in the game that if you went to the corner and shot a three, you would make it like every time as like a fadeaway. So it's a funny thing on Family Guy. But I didn't know as a kid, it was like my first introduction to a basketball game. Oh, the other thing I was going to mention, we also did have Jordan versus Bird on the NES. That was also yeah. uh, an NES game that I played a lot. So a couple NES games that I wanted to throw out there. So I have two football on a rule mentions. Okay. First one is NFL Street. Nice. It was the first game I ever played on my first, like, real console that my mom bought for me. So I grew up with my cousin, mm-hmm. and he had a PS1, and I was able to play the PS1 occasionally, but I, I was so young, mm-hmm. I barely really knew how to play games. I just played it occasionally. Yeah. The original Xbox was the first console I got in 2002. Nice. I, I I still have the memory of being in the store and just the excitement of realizing my mom was buying me the Xbox. And the first game I ever played that night, my mom let me stay up like an hour late. <laughs> she let me play NFL Street. 
and just the how fun that game was being able to like jump off of walls and do flips and all different types of like game breaker combos yeah ricky williams was it was like a a drawn uh cover with ricky williams as the cover athlete mm-hmm. and he was a monster in that game I, I just loved that game and it was the first game i ever played yeah. on my first official console <laughs> Yeah. NFL Street and NFL 2K5, which most people that are like deep football gamers still say is like top two greatest football game ever. Yeah. There are animations in 2K5 that are still better than what Madden has today. The presentation was elite. They had like pregame, post game shows. They showed highlights of games that you didn't play. Like it, it was so in depth. Mm hmm. And stuff that you just don't see in football games today. Yeah. And, yeah, two, NFL 2K5. Terrell Owens on the cover. Eagles Terrell Owens. Yeah. Great game. That was just before I got into football, so I didn't play any, like, early football games. The only – the first football game that I ever played was Madden 2000 on the N64. Yeah. Um, I played that a lot. Was um, that right before, like, a, like new graphics started? When it was still like kind of pixelated players, a little bit, yeah. I mean, it was technically 3D graphics, but it was still think of it almost like PS One. Yeah. Um, that was the only game, and then I didn't like football growing up, so it wasn't until Madden 2007 that I started playing football that games again. Yeah. Um, however, is that all your honorable mentions? Uh, I have one more. Okay, so I'll I'll bunch yeah. my last two after this one. Um, speaking of another football game. This is actually my only football game on my list. Um, I love Madden as a series. There just was never one that I could think of that stuck out, per se. Um, But the game that stood out for me for football, because my first console was the N64, and this came to home consoles after it was in the arcade, NFL Blitz. Quick quick question before an elite. Elite arcade game, first of all. Mm -hmm. But... Did your dad like give you his N64 or they bought you an no, N64? No, this was my first system. Okay. So the N64 came out in the mid-90s. I can't remember exactly when. Um, so I was like five or six. Um, and so like Super Mario 64 was coming out. And the game that my dad and I used to play was Mario on the NES. And that's kind of how I got into gaming. And so when that came out and it had the new Mario game, he got me the N64. Um it wasn't until later, though, that I realized that N- NFL Blitz was on the N64, but I had played it at arcades growing up and stuff like that, and uh, so it was just always a fun game. You're able to, like, tackle people and make all these <laughs> stinking tackles after the play and do all this crazy stuff, and then now, like, they've really released the game, and you can't do that anymore. It doesn't make sense to me, um, but it was just a lot of fun for, for somebody that didn't like football growing up. Um, at least when I was younger, NFL Blitz was a fun one. Your last honorable mention, because my, my last, last honorable fun. mention isn't a specific year of a game; mm-hmm. it's just an overall game. <clears throat> so there were times where I I didn't have certain sports games, but I I lived close to where my uncle p- lived, and he had a PS3, and he would have pretty much all the new sports games when they came out, specifically football, basketball, and baseball. And every year he would have the new MLB 2K. Hmm. And playing the creative player, like my player uh, mode in that game, Mm -hmm. every year he had MLB 2K from like 07 to like 11, 12. I would come over to his house on the weekends and like grind doing my my player. (laughs) Like playing through MLB seasons, just improving my player, hitting home runs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was a big fan of MLB 2K in those days. Yeah, we played a lot of 2K8, I believe. Um, It's funny that you bring up the the my player type stuff. I was always a franchise guy. I like doing the fantasy drafts, like building my team and seeing how I can do. Um, All right, so we can get on our top five. My last two honorable mentions are fun ones. Wii Sports is one. (laughs) I I I wouldn't even have thought of Wii Sports. I couldn't leave it out of the list. It's a little bit of everything, but especially the bowling part of it. My family is big into bowling, or at least... We played bowling video games. For I can some only reason. imagine how competitive, yeah, those bowling games would get. Just because I know how competitive they got with people I played. Yeah, with. so like, just because it's easy, everybody can play it. Made it a lot of fun. Then my last honorable mention that I want to mention because this was such a nostalgic time for me. 
Do you remember being able to get CDs in cereal boxes? Yes. So there used to be a lineup of humongous entertainment games. And there was like, you know, like uh, Freddy Fish and Putt Putt Saves the Zoo, stuff like that. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, you understand. Listen, there, there was a Pizza Hut special where you could get a Tony Hawk game. Wow, I don't remember I'm that I'm pretty one. sure. That goes back to like the okay. late 90s. Cool. Yeah. And so what you would do is that there was all these different games in these CDs. I would get them all the time. They were always in my favorite cereal boxes. But I had, when I learned that this one came out, four cereal boxes, I had to get it. And I searched and searched and pulled like every box until it was the actual one. Backyard Baseball on the computer. Wow, Backyard Baseball. Pablo, Pablo Sanchez, Sanchez is such a nostalgia trip for so many people. Pete Wheeler was my guy. He was terrible at everything, but he could <laughs> fly on the bases. Eventually, they made Backyard Sports into backyard a whole series. Backyard Basketball. Yep. Well, it's my game. I yeah. love backyard basketball. And see, I love the original when they didn't have any pro athletes, but it was fun as they added pro athletes throughout the years. They started doing ba- basketball, football, baseball. They had everything, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so that was my biggest like nostalgia one that I used to play a I loved, lot. I love that one. Yeah. So, yeah, nice pull. So now we're into our top five. What's your number five? My number five... Um, You'll notice this is kind of a trend. Sound video game soundtracks mean a lot to me. They do. I I agree. Yeah, and Madden 04, the one with Michael Vick on the cover, mm-hmm. 100 speed Michael Vick, the ultimate glitch. Yeah. That wasn't the reason why it was my favorite game. That was a huge part of it. Mm-hmm. Just like playing with Michael Vick and being unstoppable. But that game implemented the hit stick. I think that game implemented being able to like point blockers in a direction mm-hmm. where you wanted them to go when you were running. Just, it, it was such a polished Madden game with uh, like unlimited features, mm-hmm. and the soundtrack is like one of my top three favorites ever. Like the perfect balance of like rock music and hip hop. Yeah, <clears throat> and like the it would just be banger after banger after banger nonstop. Like you would play mini games mm-hmm. when Madden still had mini games and they were fun, and you could just like play mini games for hours trying to get gold yeah. in each game. And the soundtrack would just keep rolling, and it would just be great for, like, two, three hours. Mm -hmm. That's what I love the most about Madden 04. The franchise mode was great. Yeah. The gameplay was awesome. The first things I talked about were great. But, yeah, just, like, the extra stuff, like, the mini games and the soundtrack, I loved Madden 04 so much. Yeah. It's my five. Nice. I like it. My number five also has to do with the soundtrack, but also because of the gameplay. I've talked about NASCAR a lot. NASCAR had to make my list. I played a lot of NASCAR games growing up. And in the early 2000s, there was some good ones. But my favorite one was NASCAR 2005, Chase for the Cup on the GameCube. The reason that I like this game so much is because you literally could start in like, this was the first time, I think, that they implemented being able to start at like the lower series. So you could do a dirt track driver. And then if you did good enough, you would eventually make it to the truck series. Then you'd make it to the, I don't remember what it was called, the one below the big time cars. And then you get into that actual NASCAR Cup Series. So you could, like, race your way through. And on the way, there was, like, like little weird challenges where you would race Jeff Gordon in Corvettes or something. Like, there was just some goofy <laughs> stuff. Um, there was, like, these custom tracks. And there was one that was a dome. So it's almost like a straight circle. That was my favorite run one because, like, me and my brother could do it. And it was just really short. You could do this stupid thing if you're, you know, way behind. You could turn around and crash into all the cars. I enjoyed that stuff too, but the gameplay was just like super smooth. You know, driving games are always kind of weird with um, sometimes the movement, but that game was just so smooth. And again, it had a really good soundtrack. There was another good mix of like rock and classics and a little bit of hip hop and stuff. So like while you're driving, you're listening to tunes. And to me, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, now that I'm th- I, I would have added a racing game, but it's not professional racing. So I don't, I don't know if it would have counted. Need for Speed would have made my list. Yeah. It's, it's like street racing. Yeah, that's kind of where I yeah. cross the line, too. My number four is the first college football game that I fell in love with. The one with Desmond Howard on the cover. The first one that had Road to Glory. NCAA Football 05. Mm-hmm. It was just the, like, the, the top-tier level of, like, presentation 
And it was when I started to fall in love with college sports. And it was everything that I loved about it from the, the school, um, the school songs that would play when you were going through the menus, Mm -hmm. the starting road to glory where you could pick any position and just see a go to university and like become a legend hitting different goals. Mm -hmm. First time getting into like, uh, seasons and recruiting and yeah, doing that stuff. NCAA 05 set the ground for like what the game would officially become. And it's one of the best games of the series. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. NCAA football 05. Great game. Nice. And the ability to pump up the stadium <laughs> at a home game. Yeah. Was awesome too. <clears throat> um, didn't they have like a mascot thing in in those games? Yeah, eventually? The mascot challenges. Yeah, I played a little bit of some of the college football games. That was more my brother. I think we had the one with Tim Tebow on the cover. Is that ten or something? Uh, I think it was like ten. Yeah, ten or eleven. Um, my number four is another one that's kind of out of left field. My number four, and it was tough for me to pick one because there's two different ones. There's one on the N64 and one on the GameCube. But I went with the original, the N64 one, because. It's the one I think I played the most. Mario Golf. That is one heck of an out there pick. Yes. And and this I was like it. this was also on the verge because, you know, it's Mario. It's not like professional <laughs> golf. But it's not the difference of like professional racing and street racing necessarily. Like they're still they're just playing golf. You're just it's different characters. Um in this game it had a putt putt mode that I played all the time. And you could like do different cups to like unlock new characters. And I always like having like some sort of challenge or something that I'm going towards. Um, and again, it's just a game that was super fun. It was one that like my parents would play with me when I was younger and like the whole family could enjoy because like putt putt's not too hard. Um, and just the gameplay in itself was really smooth. It was fun. You're playing with all these Mario characters. It kind of got me into liking golf games. Um, and so, yeah, that's my number four. Nice. My number three is it's more of a personal pick for me than like it being one of the greatest games in the series. Mm-hmm. NBA 2K13. Mm. I think it was the first 2K where I really got into like the grind of both playing like seasons and like my player. I, I just, I played it like every day after school. Mm-hmm. I would, it was like a daily routine. I would wake up, make sure I recorded first take. Yeah. So I could watch it after school. I would get home, watch first take, like eat some food. And then I would just play 2K for hours. Mm-hmm. And 2K13 was like that game for me in high school. Then the soundtrack, that was the year it was curated by Jay-Z. Yeah. He's my all-time favorite artist and rapper. His uh, He had offshoots. Of like Kanye West and Nas, they had a bunch of songs on the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Some of my other favorite all time rappers, and the the rest of the music of other genres were great too. So it was my favorite rapper curating the entire soundtrack. Some yeah. of my favorite artists, and I was just completely into the game. So the music was like there all the time. It was music I loved, and a basketball game I was just into. So NBA Two K Thirteen was my game. It was my Two K. Yeah. Um, which my number three is also a basketball game and it's one that you already mentioned. Um, so I won't delve on it too long, but it's NBA live 2005. I had to pick between a great game. 2004 and 2005, but 2005, the intro song is so just stuck in my mind about how it comes in. And then for me, I was, I mean, 12, 13 years old, probably 12. Um, I would have, like, it was crazy to me that they, like, incorporated all these NBA team names in the intro song as they're showing, like, the highlights. And for some, I just thought that was the coolest thing. And then just all the songs in that game, I still, like, enjoy listening to, going back to, and seeing them. NBA Live 05 is kind of special, too, because there are songs that are, like, specifically made for that soundtrack. There are like very few songs on there that mm-hmm. were like hits on the radio. There were like great songs made for NBA Live. Yeah. And that was like 
awesome. The song my my main aim and Carolina Pride were two of my favorite songs, and that's probably part of my reason of starting to enjoy like hip hop and stuff early on is just from playing basketball games. So NBA Live 2005, my number three. <clears throat> Where are we at on time? Uh, we got 15 minutes, so okay. I, I saved a good amount of time for our top two. So my number two, this game is probably, the, I've spent the most hours <laughs> just <laughs> grinding away and like being so locked in and focused on this game mm-hmm. from the end of high school through college until basically like the game got too scratched up. And my system didn't work that great anymore. So I'll just stop playing the game at that point. NCAA football 14, the last college football game ever released. Yep. The, at that last game, they perfected recruiting. It was simple enough for everybody to understand, but also kind of difficult to where like you really had to put time in. Mm-hmm. Like you could create a coach or you could just go along with the coach of the program taking a low tier program and going through like five, six years building up to a national championship Mm -hmm. felt so just, it felt great. Yeah. Like you, you really felt like you did something taking like UMass or one of those other bottom tier schools Mm -hmm. to the top. Like I remember my last uh, dynasty that I did on that game before I stopped playing was Florida International. And I was on like year seven of that dynasty. Mm-hmm. And I, it's, it's so addicting. Getting, getting like starting to get those recruits mm-hmm. and then keeping it rolling and winning games, getting sp- specific guys that can win Heismans, yeah. like making them the focus of your offense, mixing up your the way your style of play is depending on your players. It, it, it was just such a satisfying game to play. Yeah, and it never got old. Like picking new schools and finding new players to like fit into your team and what style mm. and road to glory, obviously creating a player, having them go through four se- four years of a school at any position. Yeah, trying to win the Heisman, and you could import your player to Madden if you wanted to. I didn't do it often, but yeah, it, it was it was just such a satisfying game. And, yeah, I put in too much time. (laughs) Well, I loved it so much. It must have been worth it because as a collector myself, I keep track of uh, a lot of game stuff. And because that was the last football game, college football game ever made, and people regard it so highly as being one of the best, if not the best, that game is worth about $100 these days. Um, It's one Mm -hmm. that's stood the test of time. Usually uh, sports games are cheap. And that one is not. I've seen it go for more than a hundred. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> on like his, Amazon. Yeah. It spiked over uh, COVID. It's slowly coming back down, but it's it's insane. And that's one that I never played, and I now I probably never will. Yeah. If I still have my case and my copy, yeah. but just it, hold yeah, on to it. It's it's just so scratched up that it barely yeah. works anymore. Right. Um, my number two is a series that I fell in love with early on, and it got me big into action sports. My number two is Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4. Um, Specifically 4. Yes. Okay. Uh, 4 is probably because, you know, it's just the one that I played the most. Um, I wouldn't, maybe it's not the best one, um, but for me, it's definitely one of the top ones for me. Um, I played the original ones on the N64. Those were a lot of fun, um, but they just weren't as refined, I felt like, at the time. Um, But when it came to Tony Hawk 4, it was on the GameCube, so it was on new hardware. The graphics were better. Um, there was even more characters. And the maps that you could play were so fun. Like, I was skating on Alcatraz. I was at the <laughs> zoo. And, like, I just fell in love with action sports when I was younger. I never, used to watch the X Games I never played year, so. any. I never played any action sports. I always thought I could, but I was always too scared. I tried skateboarding for, like, a summer, and yeah. it, it didn't really work out. Yeah. So I was always watching the X Games and things like that. Um, and I just vividly remember there's like this one point in Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4 where you're you're skitching or holding on to the back of an elephant and it's like 
pooping as you're dr- <laughs> as you're sketching it. It's so dumb and it's so funny, but as a as a kid, that was just it was like an open playground to do whatever I wanted. Um and I never really experienced that in a game until then. So that's my number two. Yeah. I, I used to play like one of the original Tony Hawk Pro Skater games mm. on the PlayStation One. Yeah. I I used to love how fun it was mm-hmm. playing those games. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, number one. Number one. What do you have? What do you want me to go This for? game here. Okay. This game means everything <laughs> to me. Everything. My my love for hip hop and especially like old school, like nineties hip hop was like built and shaped <laughs> from the intro song of this game and the soundtrack. And the game itself is one of the most fun sports games ever made mm-hmm. to this day. <clears throat> Being able to do some of the stuff you could do in this game, NBA Street Volume 2. Yeah, that's that's a really good one. Just the, the start of like the intro going into the main screen with the song uh, Troy, They Will Reminisce Over You mm-hmm. by Pete Rock and CL Smooth. It, it just like gets you, it like hypnotizes you and like gets you like into like, it, it just, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. That song became one of my favorite songs ever. <clears throat> the soundtrack, like I said, it built my love for old school hip hop. The game, the game breakers being able to throw like multiple alley-oops and yeah. do all types of crazy moves and dunks. <clears throat> Even the creative players they added like, Stretch the dude with the big afro that kind of mm-hmm. looked like Julius Irving. Yeah, it it was it created like such a legendary like feel. Yeah, that no other game had, mm-hmm. and to this day, like no other game matches that vibe. Yeah, that that game had the, for me. Like it it just it was a real experience every time you turn that game on. It just got started playing. Yeah, the street <clears throat> games were really close for me. Um, I played a lot of street one that was kind of the one that we have never had street two um but i did actually play street two with uh some buddies at my friend's bachelor party just a couple months ago and that was a blast and then the funny in uh street three they brought in mario and luigi to play against you could play with you could play with the beastie boys in street three and so (laughs) there are a lot of like extra characters i have i have some old nintendo Mm -hmm. magazines and there's a one that has a poster and it's of street three and it has Mario dunking on Carmelo Anthony. <laughs> that it's is, the funniest that is thing. Amazing. Um, the street games are like no other, but I couldn't put them in my list just because at the time I didn't play them enough. I was more of like the simulation kind of guy. I, I loved, like I said, I loved building my teams and things like that. I played Tony Hawk and stuff for the off the wall stuff, but I loved street. Uh, that's a great series. Great pick. Not, I just realized something. Mm. I think there's like, there's another game I need to bring up, but I'll 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 let you go with your okay. one. We have if we have, we it, probably have time. It just made me kind of upset that, that I forgot it, and mm. I need to add it after yeah we're done with the official list. So now my number one is super easy nowadays. It used to be quite tough, but um, this game I just have so much nostalgia for. I played it the most. <clears throat> And that is NBA 2K11. They first brought in Michael Jordan in this one. It was yeah. a big anniversary. A lot of people, it's known as the best 2K ever. Yeah. Um, and I agree with that sentiment. The gameplay was super great. Um, again, the soundtrack was really good. The theme song was made by Snoop Dogg. Um, and this is the game that every day in college, I would come home, back to my dorm, finish my homework. I'd hit up the guy across the room. And I'd say, are you ready for our series? And we'd play a three-game series almost every night of 2K11. And it was... Well, those are the college memories that are the best. And it was... I mean, this was 2K11, and I was in college, like, basically the year after, because this came out in 2010. So I had already played the game a lot with my brother, doing the franchise modes, as we always do, building teams. So when I got to college, and nobody really bought the new game, and everybody was still playing 2K11... I was so excited and we just played it every single night and it wasn't, and we were like evenly matched. So it was like really good games. I was always the guy, of course, that's shooting threes. He liked getting his big man 
And so we would just do it every night. And like it, the gameplay is so good. And I don't think they've ever really gotten back to that necessarily. Um, and it's just the one that I put so much time into. And it's by far, far and away my favorite time and playing uh, of basketball games. That's a great choice. Isn't that's the one with the Jordan intro, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The first time I ever played that game. Yeah, when you boot that <clears throat> game up. That it my jaw was like on the floor mm-hmm. for like five minutes. Yeah. After that I I had to like pause the game once the game started. Mm-hmm. Like this is just different. Yeah. Yep. Good times. What's the game that you wanted to bring up? It's around the same time as when I was playing NBA Street Volume Two on my cousin's PlayStation Two. Oh three, oh four, get home after school, either play NBA Street Volume Two or this is a game me and my cousin got on Christmas. Mm-hmm. SSX Tricky. That's the snowboarding one. game. Yeah. One of the most entertaining, like zany, fun. Mm-hmm. But the game, like the gameplay was great. The characters were great. The tracks were awesome. Yeah. It, it's one of those games where you could get started and like four hours later, you'll look up and be like, where did the time go? Mm-hmm. Because you'll just be like so into every part of the game. Yeah. SSX Tricky meant so much to me, and I I love that game to this day. Yeah. Snowboarding games are big for me, too. For me, like, they didn't make the list, but they were in consideration. Because um, there's an N64 game called Snowboard Kids. Probably one of my favorite games of all time, but I just didn't feel like it worked for this list. Because um, it's almost more like a Mario Kart um, for snowboarding. But, like, there was, like, 1080 snowboarding on the N64. I played some of the SSX games. Snowboarding games are really fun. Um, another game that I wanted to mention while we have a, a minute. Um, Wave Race was another big one that was on the N64 where you're just on jet skis. You're racing yeah. jet skis. That was also a, a really fun one. So there's a lot of like tie-in type sports games uh, that didn't quite make my cut. But Yeah, there the games, like I said, Need for Speed. There are some like somewhat offshoot racing games that were like yeah. crazy taxi Right. Not really a sports game, Mm -hmm. but it's just like a chaotic racing game that was extremely fun. Right. Yeah. Racing stuff is like a whole genre in itself. Um, But yeah, this was a fun episode. This is a nostalgia trip for us. That's that was the main point. Um, Next week, we'll probably do another list unless, you know, there's news, but there probably won't be. Um, We are getting closer. I know we can kind of keep kicking college football down the road but we kind of can still um and then we'll do full college football previews then we'll do nfl stuff and we'll be back into the swing of sports season once again but probably a couple more weeks of some fun episodes that we'll think of like i said we'll try to get guests i'll i'll talk to my brother or something this week um and then try to hit up chris or something but um yeah this was fun this was views from the sidelines and we will see you guys next time looking forward to buying the ps5 when the next college football game comes out next year hopefully and everybody boycott madden stop buying that game please it's terrible